Amen. So keep your place there in Daniel chapter 9. So wherever I tell you to go in the Bible tonight, you're going to keep a bookmark in Daniel chapter 9 because that's going to be kind of our key verse that we're always going to come back to. Let's see here. Do I have my uh, chart with me? So we're starting a sermon series tonight called Daniel's 70th week. And we're going to go through in detail in the next coming weeks on the 70th week of Daniel. But first tonight, I want to preach a sermon on the 70 weeks. What is the 70 weeks all about? I made a chart for you. You should all have it in front of you. And I want to go through the 70 weeks, the idea behind it that we see here in Daniel chapter 9, and explain to you, you know, what that is all about before we can dig into the 70th week in the coming weeks. Now, a lot of people will think that um, this is fairly complicated things. I want to try to really simplify this. It's uh, honestly, Bible prophecy is not that complicated until you start making your own conclusions and coming up with things that aren't really there. So what we're going to do is we're just going to look at what the Bible says, and we're not going to add anything to it. All right, so we're going to look at what the Bible says, what the Bible doesn't say. You'll notice the chart that's in front of you. I don't have any dates on that chart. And the reason is, is because the Bible doesn't give us dates. So the Bible doesn't give us dates that things happen. The Bible gives us timelines. The Bible gives us, you know, this many years, this happened after this happened. That was kind of the idea of the clues and milestones um, theory. But if you start putting secular dates on top of Bible prophecy, then you start having to make all kinds of assumptions and things. Frankly, you just get lost in weeds that you don't need to get lost in. So I want to explain to you simply tonight um, what the 70 weeks are all about. Turn to Matthew chapter 1, and let's just get a timeline. You're going to keep your place in Daniel 9. Turn to Matthew chapter 1. Let's just get a timeline of the whole thing here. All right, look at Matthew chapter 1, and look at verse number 17. Matthew chapter 1, and look at verse number 17. Before we can understand the 70 weeks, let's just get a timeline of where we're at in history here. Look at Matthew 1:17 where the Bible says this, it says, so all the generations, so this was, of course, this large genealogy before this, but it says all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations, and from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. So that's pretty valuable right there, where it tells us that Abraham to David, 14 generations, and then David to Christ being born, 14 generations generations all right this is right after we see you know the genealogy of Christ in Matthew chapter 1 so 14 generations so the question is you know what is a generation and a generation is basically a lot of people are confused by the 14 generations because they go and they look at the kings in Judah because it is true that David's uh, messianic prophecy from God was fulfilled and in Judah all the kings in the lower kingdom were sons of, and they were of the line of David, every single one. So that's where, you know, the line of Christ, why Matthew chapter 1 is so important, showing that genealogy. But the kings were not a generation, okay? You have to understand that. There was many more than 14 kings from David to the carrying away at Babylon. You say, well, why is that? Well, it, it's, it's really simple. If you read the Bible, you know, it's... Being the king is not a great job, actually, because many of them did not serve for very long. You know, you don't, you either serve for 40 years, uh, you know, or so, like the first three kings, or, you know, you're retired early as a king, okay? I mean, there were some kings that served for two years. I think Abijah served for two years. Uh, when Azahiah was less than a year Zimri in the north, what, just a couple days or whatever that was? I mean, he didn't last, you know, very long. And, you know, look, being a king was terrible for your health, basically. All right? So king does not equal generation. All right? The way I kind of remember it as far as numbers of years, if you like to just put dates in your head, Abraham, Abraham to David, I, I always just like to think of like 450 years. Like basically Abraham to David, about 450 years, David to Babylon about 450 years. It's not exactly 450 years, but it just kind of gives you an idea of where in the BC calendar you would land, if that's the case, all right? So look, we've got 14 generations from the Babylonian captivity to Christ's birth, okay? That's what we know. And a generation is anywhere between, if you look at David to the carrying away of Babylon, David is, 
you know, like uh, 970 BC is when I think he died. And you look at the carrying away to Babylon just from secular history, it's about 424 years. And, you know, if you divide that by 14, you get about 30 years is a generation. But a generation could be anywhere from 25 to 40 years. I look at the first three kings of Israel. You look at Saul, you look at David, and you look at Solomon. They all served for 40 years. So that was kind of a generational king um, right there, um, you know, as David passed it on to his son. So a generation is not some exact date either. Okay, so all that to say 14 generations from Babylon to Christ's birth. Okay, now there's some amazing things that happened. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 25. There's some amazing things that happened in Daniel chapter 9. Daniel actually got to see the end of the captivity. Daniel got to see some amazing prophecies come true. Look at Jeremiah chapter 25. And of course, Jeremiah was, you know, during, um, right before the captivity. But look at Jeremiah chapter 25. Look at verse number 9. Jeremiah 25, look at verse number 9. The Bible says this, it says, Behold, I will take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and I will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof, and against all these nations round about, and will utterly destroy them, and make them astonishment and in hissing and perpetual desolations. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, and the sound of the millstones, and the light of the candle. This whole land shall be a desolation and astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Go to Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah chapter 29. So Daniel in Daniel chapter 9 is saying, I got to see this fulfilled. This prophecy from Jeremiah, I got to see this fulfilled. Look at verse number 10 of Jeremiah chapter 29. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. So they were under Babylonian captivity. They were in Babylon. I believe that, and I don't know the exact dates, and I don't know that you could get anyone to give you the exact dates, but they were probably under Babylonian rule most of the time that they were in captivity. But even when the Persians took over, they were still in Babylon, okay? So Daniel, though, this is kind of amazing. Turn back to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel got to see this prophecy fulfilled. I'm going to read for you Isaiah 44, verse 28. Isaiah 44, verse 28. Look what the Bible does in Isaiah 44 and verse number 28. The Bible says this, That saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. That's amazing right there. The Bible in Isaiah's time, which was a hundred years before the captivity, prophesied that this Persian king Cyrus would send them back to build the temple and to build Jerusalem, build the city. All right, this is Ezra and Nehemiah right here. Okay, so look. The prophecy of Daniel's 70th week, I, I want to just point out, because we're going to come back to this point, that Daniel got to see this one fulfilled. The end of the captivity and Cyrus sending them back to build the temple and build the city. Okay? Now again, the goal of this sermon series and the goal of tonight is not to do math. It's not to predict anything. It is just to show you the pattern of what is going to happen very clearly. And you'll see how, you know, hopefully if I do a good job of this, I, I won't have confused faces or confusion of face, as Daniel 9 says. But it's not that hard to understand. But you will also see, hopefully, how hard it would be to look into the future and try to predict what the end times is going to be or when it is going to be. Okay? Because Daniel got to see this fulfilled. Daniel. Okay? God is sending Gabriel to Daniel. All right. If Daniel gets to see something fulfilled and then Daniel doesn't understand something looking forward, we have to understand that the odds of us understanding something looking forward is probably pretty, pretty low. All right. So look, go to Daniel chapter 9, look at verse number 24. So first of all, when we look at the weeks, you have to understand that one day equals one year. All right. So one day in the week equals one year. So seven Weeks would be 49 years, 
okay? So seven times seven, 49. That, you can get that from just, uh, you know, doing the math on the days that the Bible talks about. Uh, you know, nobody has any um, qualms about the one year being um, one day as far as this prophecy goes, all right? Here's another thing. You can't read anything as far as commentary goes on this stuff because it gets wild and it gets crazy very quickly, okay? So the idea here is to just what? It's to look at the Bible. What does the Bible say? And what does that mean? for us. Okay, we're going to look at several milestone statements in this set of verses here. Okay, so Daniel's 70 weeks is 490 years is what we are talking about. All right. Now, obviously, if you look at verse number 24, it says 70 weeks, that means 490 years are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So basically what he is talking about is he is talking about up until the last thing that happens in Revelation up to the anointing of the most holy, which if you look down at your chart is what? It's the millennial reign of Christ. Up until that is 70 weeks, 490 years. Okay, well right away... If you're doing math in your head, you can say, okay, well, it was about, you know, 450 years to Christ from the Babylonian captivity, you know, 424 or what, 450 is actually like 500 and some to 33 AD. You're like, how could that be possible? 2,000 years, we're missing 2,000 years. Well, the next few verses explain it, and that's what I'm going to show you, all right? <coughs> so, the Bible here is saying is that there's 70 weeks in the first, in the first verse, it says there's 70 weeks from now, the time of Daniel, until the end, where Jesus comes back and is in charge. Okay, look at verse number 25. Verse number 25. It says, know therefore and understand that from the going forth. Now he's going to get into some, some cutting up of this 490 years. Okay, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. Okay, that's a milestone. All right, somebody actually gave. It was Cyrus that we see that I showed you the prophecy of. Cyrus gives the commandment for the, the children of Judah to go back and rebuild Jerusalem, okay? That's a milestone. We're not going to miss that. We can mark that one down, all right? It happened. Unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks, and don't miss this, three score and two weeks, okay? Now, it's interesting because this 70 weeks is cut up into three sections, and we just saw two of them right here. The first section that it is cut into is seven weeks, 49 years, okay? The next section that it's cut into is three score and two weeks, a score being 20, three times 20 plus two, 62 weeks, okay? So we see seven weeks plus 62 weeks unto Messiah the Prince. So if you look at what it takes before the Messiah comes, it takes seven weeks and 62 weeks, okay? Unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks, and the street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublous times. Okay? That's Ezra and Nehemiah right there. All right? Look at verse number 26, and then we'll go back into that in more detail. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Is there any confusion on what that could be? I mean, that is the crucifixion of Christ right there in 33 AD. That's a definite milestone. All right? The Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. He, he died for the sins of the world. We just celebrated this on Easter. And the people of the prince that shall come to destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood, and unto the end of the war, of the war desolations are determined. <clears throat> so here we see the seven weeks is done. The 62 weeks are done. The 62 weeks, if you look at your chart, the 62 weeks, the 434 years of the 62 weeks, end at Christ being crucified in 33 AD. Okay? Now, look at verse 27. And he shall confirm. So now we're at 69 weeks. We're at 62 weeks plus 7 weeks. And verse number 27, we see Daniel's 70th week. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, in the middle of that last week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, 
even unto the consummation and determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. Talking about the abomination of desolation. So all that to say this. Go back to verse number 25. <coughs> Daniel's 70th weeks, 70 weeks, is cut up into seven weeks, 62 weeks, and one week. It's cut up into three different sections. You say, why is it cut up into three different sections? The reason that it's cut up into three different sections is because those weeks are not consecutive. And if you look at the graph in front of you, you'll see that there's a gap between the seven weeks and the 62 weeks, and there's a gap between the 62 weeks and the 70th week. Okay, and we'll get to the 70th week in a second, but there's gaps there. Now, if you try to fill in those gaps, you just you, you jump through all kinds of hoops, and you, you just you can't make it work, because there's a reason God made it 7, 62, and 70, and He didn't just put it all together. All right, it's almost like He doesn't want us to exactly figure it out. Okay, I mean that's my opinion. All right, but look at verse number 25. Let's look down at the, let's look at the seven weeks. The Bible says this in verse 25. It says, "From the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem." Unto the Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublous times. So the command to go forth and build starts the seven weeks. Go to John chapter 2, keeping your place in Daniel chapter 9. Go to John chapter number 2. Let's see if, I mean, what happened? How long did it take to build this stuff? How long did it take to build the temple, the wall, all these things? Look at John chapter 2. I mean, it seems like a long time you know, 49 years to build, you know, the temple and the city. Go to John chapter 2 and look at verse number 18. <coughs> John chapter 2, look at verse number 18. The Bible says, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Of course he's talking about, you know, the temple of his body. It says in verse 21. <clears throat> then said the Jews, 40 and six years was this temple in building. Wilt thou rear it up in three days? So they said, they, right there, they give you a, a nice huge chunk of the seven days, of that first seven, sorry, seven weeks of Daniel's 70 weeks. They said 46 years it took to build this temple. And you're going to just, you're going to build it in three days? They're like, what are you, crazy? So the seven weeks, go to Ezra chapter 1. We'll just, I don't want to spend a lot of time in Ezra. But Daniel witnessed the 70-year captivity prophesied in Jeremiah come to the end. The seven weeks is talking about not just the building of Zerubbabel's temple, but it is talking about there was also somebody that came back to build the city. Because if you look at verse number 25 again, you'll notice that it says to restore and to build Jerusalem, not just the temple. Okay, so this is where Ezra and Nehemiah come in. But look at verse number one of Ezra, chapter number one. So Ezra is the priest. Ezra is the priest that goes back to serve in the temple that Zerubbabel is building. Okay, now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, sound familiar? The word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. Sound familiar? The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. Then he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him an house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Now, look, go, just flip over to Ezra chapter 4 real quickly. Notice, notice in verse number 25, again, it talks about how they built this temple, and they did this building of Jerusalem in troublous times. We see that in Ezra 4.1. We see that all through Ezra, and especially Nehemiah, but look at verse number one. It says, Now the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, and there's your, there's your trouble. Okay, they didn't like it, so they caused all kinds of problems throughout several kings and several rulers in Persia to the building of the temple and the building of the wall. All right, go to Ezra chapter 7. Go to Ezra chapter number 7. Here's some proof for you if you just need to know this just for fun, that Ezra, the temple was built first, and Nehemiah finished second. If you go to Ezra chapter number 7, 
you'll see what I'm talking about. Ezra chapter number 7. Look at verse number 8 of Ezra chapter 7. So Ezra and Nehemiah are right after each other in the Bible. So if you look at Ezra chapter 7, look at verse number 8, where the Bible says, And he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was the seventh year of the king. Now go to Nehemiah chapter number 2. Nehemiah chapter number 2. And look at verse number 1. It says, and it came to pass. So Nehemiah is building the city. Okay, Nehemiah is building the city. Ezra and Zerubbabel are in the temple. All right? Look at verse number 1. It says, it came to pass in the month Nisan, that the 20, in the 20th year of Zer Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him. I took up the wine, gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before him sad in his presence. This is where Nehemiah is approaching um, the king of Persia, this Art of Xerxes, and he's going to ask to go back. But look at verse number, um, and I think that this Art of Xerxes, again, my opinion right here, there's several kings here, okay? There's two Dariuses, there's possibly two Art of Xerxes, there's, there's a Xerxes, it's, it's very confusing. But if you just go by what the Bible says, I think that this Art of Xerxes in Nehemiah chapter 2 was Azaharius, which was Esther's husband, okay? That's what I think. And here's, here's, here's how simple I think that is. First of all, it matches up with the dates of the kings, actually, the historical dates of kings. But if you look at verse number 8, no, look at verse number 6. I just find it interesting that in verse number 6, it says, And the king said unto me, the queen sitting by him. I mean, why would it put that in there if that wasn't Esther? I think that that was Esther. That's just my opinion, though. I don't want to add... Um, to the Bible, okay? But anyway, all that to say this. Zerubbabel builds the temple, Ezra arrives in the temple, and then apparently three years later, Nehemiah finishes the wall and the city in troublous times. 49 years, okay? Very easy to see, very easy to get to from the Bible. And look, 49 years, if you read the story of Ezra and Nehemiah, it's a disaster, I mean, there's people writing to the king and just causing all kinds of problems. I mean, they get permission from the king to, to uh, build the temple and build the wall. And then, you know, all these people go against them and, like, you know, backstab them and convince the king that they're trying to take and become powerful and take, become their own kingdom again. And then the king stops it. And then Darius, another Darius, starts it again later on after he finds the original, you know, scroll from... Cyrus, they find, you know, the records that it was actually legally um, being done. But, I mean, it's like, I mean, it's like the California high-speed rail. I mean, you know, honestly. I mean, it's just all this trouble. Like, all these people trying to stop the work. It's just everyone trying to stop the work. There's more people that don't want the work to go on than want the work to finish, and that means it takes forever. It's not like they couldn't build the wall or they couldn't build the temple. It's just all this political problems that they were having. And that's what Daniel says, troublous times. Okay, so 49 years, 49 years. Now, go back to Daniel chapter number nine. <coughs> so that's very easy to see in Ezra, Nehemiah, how they went back, you know, even the New Testament in John chapter two talks about how the temple itself took 46 years and then to rebuild the city and finish everything up 49 years. Very easy to see, very easy to fit together. All right, look at Daniel chapter nine. And look at verse number 26. Now, there's a gap between the seven weeks and the 62 weeks. That's why the Bible cuts it up into 7, 62, and 1. Okay, look at verse number 6. Or verse number 26. And after three score and two weeks. So, after the 62 weeks. If you look down at your chart, 62 weeks times 7, 434. So, after 434 years... <coughs> Christ is cut off. Messiah, Jesus Christ, is crucified. That's what happens in 33 AD. So it's, all we need to know is that there's a gap between the 7 and the 62. We don't have to go back, you know, we could go back and subtract 33 AD and go back 434 years to, you know, what is that, 400 BC or whatever, and try to find some significant event in history or whatever. But that's just simply making things up. Okay, so all we need to know is that this milestone of Christ being cut off, which is very easy for us to look back and see, is the end of the 62 weeks. Okay, 
Now the end of the 62 weeks, that puts us at 69 weeks. Look at verse number 26 again. It says, and the people of the prince shall come to destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and to the end the war des of the war, the desolations are determined. So the remaining 62 weeks occur, and then Jesus is crucified in 33 AD, the Messiah being cut off. Looking back, we can easily see this, okay? But look, God just didn't want to give that forward vision. Daniel didn't understand what we're understanding today. Daniel himself didn't see that forward vision. And God doesn't want to, I think that God doesn't want to give that forward vision, and I'll get into this in a little bit more detail, is because people would have claimed it. People would have claimed, people already claim forward vision just by making things up, all right? So look, there's a gap between the 49 years, there's a gap, and then 62 weeks, 434 years, Jesus is crucified, and now there's also a gap between the 69th and the 70th week, okay? But now we need to enter into something else here. There's another twist to Daniel's 70 weeks, and the twist is this, that there are shadow fulfillments of all prophecies. So prophecies have shadow or partial fulfillments. You know, the Bible talks about, in Hebrews, how everything done in the Old Testament was not done, you know, on accident. It was a shadow of things to come. It was a picture of Christ. Leviticus 16, you know, the, the sacrifice in Leviticus 16, it was a shadow of the Messiah. It was a shadow of Jesus. What part? The whole chapter is a shadow of Jesus Christ. Okay, look down at verse number 27. So there's shadow prophecies, and I'm going to show you what some of those are. And it says, and he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, so this is Daniel's 70th week in verse 27. In the middle of that week, the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Meaning someone's going to go into the temple and say, we're done sacrificing here. We're going to seize that. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. Now, who is this he? Okay. And it talks about the prince of the people, the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city. So we're talking about this prince that shall come to destroy the city, okay? We're talking about this person is going to stop the sacrifice. This person is going to do this, you know, oblation to seize and, and, and overspread these abominations. This is what we call the abomination of desolation, and I preached on that, all right? So definite milestone, Messiah cut off, 33 A.D., but now in 70 A.D., the temple was destroyed, just as Jesus prophesied. Turn back to Luke chapter 21. Go, or turn forward to Luke chapter 21, keeping your place in Daniel chapter. You say, well, then is, that, is Daniel's 70th week done? Well, we'll get there in just a minute. But look at Luke chapter 21 and verse number 1. In A.D. 67, a war breaks out. A war breaks out between the Jews and the Romans. And in the midst of that week, that war happens to last how long? It happens to last seven years. And in the middle of that seven-year period, in the midst of that week, the Romans under Titus destroy the temple in Jerusalem. Look at verse number one of Luke chapter 21. <coughs> and he looked up and he saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury, and he saw also a certain poor widow casting in the other two mites. And he said, of a truth I say to you, this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. For all these have their abundance cast into the offerings, under the offerings of God, but she of her penury hath cast in all the living that she had. And as some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts, he said, as for these things which ye behold, the days will come in which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. This is Jesus prophesying the destruction of the temple that happens just a, few, a couple decades later in 70 A.D. by the Romans. All right, so look, that's, uh, that's another evidence that the entire New Testament was written before 70 A.D. is because they definitely would have said something if it was 75 A.D. They definitely would have pointed back at the fulfilled prophecy in Luke chapter 21. But again, we can look back and see that that prophecy was fulfilled. Also, here's another shadow for you. So we got a seven-year period there. We got the temple destroyed. 
in the middle of that seven year period, you're like, man, that's the 70th week right there, right? I mean, we're done, we're done here. But even in, second, in the second century BC, meaning 200 years before you know, the birth of Christ, there was a Greek king, Antichius Epiphanes, who also defiled the temple. He also went into the temple of God and he put up a statue of, of Zeus and he did, a, I think it was a, a pig sacrifice to um, this false god in the temple of God. So that was another shadow prophecy of Daniel's 70th week. So you say, well, how do you know when it's the real one? How do you know that there's another one coming towards the end times? And the answer is the entire book of Revelation. If we didn't have the book of Revelation, it would be a lot more confusing. Turn to Revelation chapter number 13. But these were shadow prophecies. So you have to understand when you think you're going to you know, predict some prophecy in your own mind, just remember all these shadow prophecies. What must they have been thinking when Antich Antichius Epiphanes defiles the temple. What must they have been thinking when they had the book of Revelation and they saw what happened in 70 AD? What must they have been thinking? They must have been thinking, this looks pretty similar to what Daniel chapter 9 is talking about. But look at Revelation chapter 13. <coughs> the Bible says, and I stood in verse number 1, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his, his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon, that's Satan, gave him his power and his seat and a great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Notice that all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who's able to make war with him? Who's saying this? All the world is saying this. So that is the first thing that you need to realize about the book of Revelation, is that the book of Revelation is talking about all the world. This is something that is happening in Revelation chapter 13. And the Daniel 70th week that we're going to study through in the book of Revelation, mainly, is going to be talking about things that are happening globally. They're going to be happening in all the world. And there was given a mouth, <coughs> speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. Divide that by 12 for me, and you will find that it is three and a half years. Exactly. All right? I mean, in Revelation 11, you see, you see these numbers that are about three and a half years, 1260, you know, popping up all over the book of Revelation. It's not a coincidence, folks. It's talking about the final, the actual end times, Daniel's 70th week. And look, if you go back to Daniel chapter 9 and you look at the very first verse of the prophecy, I think it was verse number 24, you'll see that 70 weeks are determined and the end is to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. That's the end as we go into the millennial reign of Christ that Revelation talks about. So basically, how do we know that there's another 70th week? Because the things in Revelation that are very specific have not been fulfilled yet. Not even close. Not even the fact that it's global. But I mean, the rapture, the coming of Christ in the clouds. I mean, all the vials, all the trumpets. Think about it. The locusts from hell stinging men for five months. I mean, did we miss that? Is it possible that that happened like in 1820 and we just didn't, we forgot about it? The star called Wormwood falling from heaven, I mean, you know, to earth, poisoning a third of the waters of the earth. I mean, did we miss that at some point? Pretty sure the environmentalists would be bringing that one up if that one happened, right? I mean, the same thing though, if we keep reading Revelation chapter 13, the same thing is the mark of the beast. When I mean, you think about the mark of the beast that happens in Revelation chapter number 13, look, you're not going to miss that. You're not, not going to miss that actual, and look, there's a lot of shadows of that one too. And the problem is people will take shadows and they'll try to just make it the thing. 
And then they, they get into all kinds of weirdisms and, and, and crazy things. So look, we didn't miss these things in Revelation. And that's what we're going to be talking about in this coming sermon series. If you look at Daniel's 70 weeks, 70 weeks on your chart, it's pretty simple. You know, it's the, 70, it's the seven weeks building Jerusalem and the temple. There's a gap. There's 434 years to Christ crucified. And then there's a gap. And then we have the shadow of the Roman Seven Years War, which right in the middle of that is the 70 AD destruction of the temple. But then we have the end times 70th week coming. And that is what we're going to study through. We didn't miss it. All right? It's very specific. Very specific things are going to happen. But look, what are we doing? We're looking forward at Daniel's 70th week, the end times 70th week. I mean, there's much to be fulfilled. Okay, turn to Mark chapter 13. Turn to Mark chapter 13. Let me just uh, uh, give you a couple thoughts to end with here. But hopefully that, uh, you know, makes sense to you. And you can see, you know, kind of the, spe- the, the general um, idea of the end times 70th week. And we're going to fill in a lot of details on that bottom chart as we go through this sermon series. But look at Mark chapter 13. We're going forward. We're looking forward at this 70th week that is coming. We can look back and the, at, at the Roman, you know, at the Roman and the Greek abomination of desolations, and we can say that was a shadow of fulfillment. Easily, because we're looking back on it, and we know that the other things in the Bible did not happen. It's easy to look back. All right? But the, the purpose of Bible prophecy is this. Look at Mark chapter 13, verse 37. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. The purpose of Bible prophecy is just for us to watch. Not to infer all sorts of things and try to conjure in the end times in our mind. Right? And that is the problem. Look, the whole point of the Clues and Milestones sermon series was, is that, you know, I mean, the covenant with many for one week. We're not going to miss that. That's a milestone. You know, the one world government. We're not going to miss these major things. The Antichrist coming on the scene. You know, I mean, maybe the Middle East peace would be solved in that covenant. I mean, we're not going to miss that, right? The abomination of desolation, we're not going to miss that. We're not going to miss these things. We'll be able to see these things. Look at Matthew chapter number 24. Let me show you another one. Look at Matthew chapter number 24. The Bible says in Matthew 24, in verse number 14, Matthew 24 is talking about the end times. Jesus is telling the disciples about the timeline of Daniel's 70th week. Look at verse 14. It says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. At the Greek abomination of desolation 200 years before Christ, the gospel hadn't even arrived to the Gentiles. I mean, the gospel hadn't even gone out to anybody outside of Israel. I mean, so that has clearly not happened at that point. So look, the whole point is this. Anybody could just go out and start a cult and say, just by grabbing one of these things and running with it. And that's what they do. They go out and they, they start cults and they say, you know, I mean, I could take Daniel 24 and verse number 4, which you all know that I love, where it talks about knowledge shall increase in the end times. And I could just say the Internet was the start of Daniel's 70th week in 1995 when Al Gore invented it or whatever. I'm joking. But you all are too young for that joke. You're like, who's Al Gore? <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> but the point is this, you could take any one of these things and just run with it and then just think you can just predict the end times. This is, this is the, <coughs> I could say the gospels made it around the world. The Lord revealed to me that the gospel in 2016 had officially made it around the world and now it, the end times are starting. I mean, this is what people do. In 1950s, the transistor was invented and that is the mark of the beast. The Mark of the Beast, you can just have fun with that one all day long. I mean, the Amazon One thing, who's seen that? Where you like wave your hand over the, you know, you wave your hand, I guess it would be this hand. You wave your hand over the thing and you can just pay with your hand. I mean, people could be like, Mark of the Beast. No, that's not the Mark of the Beast. Because no one is saying, take this, or you can't buy and sell anywhere, or we're going to kill you. And you have to worship this image. There's no temple. There's no image. There's no antichrist. There's no abomination of desolation. There's all these things. Could they be? They're shadows. They're shadows of things to come. We should pay attention to those things. We should pay attention to knowledge increasing and be like, yeah, that sounds like Daniel 12.4. 
We should pay attention to these things, but we're not to make clues into milestones and just run crazy with it. This is the Millerites. This is the Seventh-day Adventists. This is what they've done for 200 years or 150 years. This is the Jehovah's Witnesses. They predicted the end times, I don't know how many times. A lot. And finally, they're just like, yeah, it happened, but it's just, you missed it. You weren't paying attention. You weren't giving enough money. Or maybe you wouldn't have missed Jesus coming back. I mean, we study that in the American Heresy series original again and again and again. All these false prophets who are just taking these silly little things and is connecting it with a Bible verse and pretending like they can just predict the end times. Daniel himself didn't know what this meant. Think about that. Daniel, whom God sent Gabriel to, did not have any idea what this 70 weeks. I can about imagine Daniel's just like, what in the world? I better write this down, though. He didn't understand. Well, I mean, it must have been cool for him to see the prophecies that he did see, that he did know were fulfilled. But how did he see those prophecies? He saw them when he looked back on them. That's what we need to understand. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. But with the 70 weeks, he had no clue what that meant. I mean, we understand what the seven weeks meant because we're looking back on it. We understand what the 62 weeks means because we're looking back on it. It's easy for us. He's looking forward on everything. He doesn't understand. He's just writing down what God wants him to write down. These things aren't clear looking forward, folks. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I mean, the fact that looking forward, you know, we just don't know. That, and then the fact that there's shadow prophecies as well, I mean, it's almost impossible to say until you're looking back. And the Bible kind of tells us that. Look at 1 Corinthians 13, verse number 9. The Bible says, for we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, you notice that? When are we going to know? When it's here. Then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly. Like, this is Daniel. This is us and everything we look forward on. But then, face to face. Hey, when it's here, we'll be able to match it up with the Bible and we'll know. When these milestones happen, that's the whole point of milestones. It's like you're face to face with it. Christ crucified. That's a milestone. Abomination of desolation. We're not going to miss these milestones. Now I know in part but then shall I know, even also am I known. Look, when it happens, you'll know, is what the Bible is saying. So look, as Bible-believing saved Christians, it's great that we know what to watch for. Patterns. Patterns. These, these shadows are patterns repeating themselves. I mean, just look, I mean the, just look at the pattern of America and look at the sermon from this morning. If America decides to just shove away shame and just get rid of shame, what's going to happen? We know what's going to happen. So aside from end times, I think the patterns of the Bible are more valuable to us, honestly. Just the overall trends and patterns. I know that if we do not embrace shame again in this country, I know exactly what's going to happen. And so do you. If you have a Bible in front of you, because God literally tells us that again and again again. And again, but when you start saying, well, in, you know, 2026, this exact thing is going to happen, that's when, you know, God's going to make a fool of you. So we're not to turn clues into milestones and just look for those shadow fulfillments. See, the problem is people get overboard and they, they look at that things that they want to happen. And another thing, there's this weird group of people out there that thinks that they can make the end times happen. Like there's this group that's trying to rebuild the third temple and all this kind of stuff and like we're trying to usher in the end times. It's like, hey, you know, God doesn't need your help. I mean, he's got this. You know, he doesn't need people to go out and usher in the end times and quite frankly, like why would you want to do that anyway? Shouldn't we be hoping for more time to get more people saved Amen. before God buttons this whole thing up? But the problem is when you have this weird mentality where you just like want, you know, the end times to happen and want, you know, everything to just fall to pieces or whatever. You know, when all you have a ha is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, quite frankly. 
And that's why you see all these weird people on the internet just picking some verse that they don't even understand and just making some weird doctrine out of it. You know, the Amazon one, oh, it looks like you put something in your hand. That's it. Let me make up a bunch of stuff now. You know, but look, Daniel saw certain fulfillments. He saw certain fulfillments. He saw the captivity end. We can see clearly looking back. We can see that the seven weeks is done. We can see looking back that the 62 weeks is done. We can see that there were shadow fulfillments of the 70th week. But what we are going to do is we are going to look at what the book of Revelation and the entire Bible says about the end times 70th week. So hopefully that makes some sense out of what the 70 weeks of Daniel is and then what we should take away from it and what we shouldn't turn it into. Okay, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.